Episode 4, Genetic Mutilation. We continue the story as Peter panics. The arms in his sides cause him to get off balance as he falls over. Luckily, Aunt May isn't in. She's at work at the moment, leaving Peter by himself. Peter stands up, thinking about his next move. How did this happen? He'll think to himself. Peter looks towards the window and thinks about what Mary Jane will think of him. A part deep inside of him knew that she'd understand his situation. Heck, she's the only one who really gets up anything he goes through. But he can't. He can't let her see him like this. Peter decides to do the only thing that he knows how to do when he's stressed or can't think of a next move, take to the skies. He puts the suit back on and rips holes in the sides for his arms to fit through and takes off into the skyline of New York City. We cut to Aunt May at feast. A decent portion of this first half of the episode will be exploring this side plot thread of Aunt May at the feast center. After Martin Lee's imprisonment, she has been overworked trying to keep the shelter afloat by herself. She's struggling and this scene will be here to represent that dark circles under her eyes and a monotonal attitude will be present. She will be lost, confused, disorientated, overworked. And not only that, she has to think about bills once more. We will then cut to Mary Jane Watson, who is laying on her bed waiting for Peter to arrive. She will look at the time and it's 10 minutes past when he said he'd be there. He's probably just late, right? She'll think to herself. But as minutes pass, it becomes clearer that he's not coming. A slight tear rolls down her cheek as she wipes it away quickly, trying not to be caught up in emotion towards something that she knows is inevitable. She decides to go downstairs to see her aunt as she lay on the sofa, coughing. MJ goes over to comfort her, and Anna says that she's okay. Anna asks about Peter and if he's still coming over. MJ tells her that he isn't. Anna will look down and say that May has always told her that something troubles that boy, and she doesn't know what it is. She'll go on to say that ever since Ben died, Peter has been different. She wishes that MJ knew Peter from before. MJ, knowing that that's not true, can't reassure Anna that Peter is one of the kindest souls you'll ever meet without revealing his secret identity and what he actually does on a day-to-day -day basis. In the end, MJ just tells her that he's got a lot on right now. Anna Watson will then go on to reveal to MJ very hesitantly that she's gonna have to sell the house. MJ, confused and caught off guard, will react accordingly. What? She'll say. Anna says due to her rising medical bills and the rising cost around the city in general, she's going to have to move out. MJ will ask, well, what will happen to them? Where will they go? Anna says that May has said that they can stay there if it comes to it, but really she doesn't want to burden May, as Anna at this moment in time is incapable of working while May is struggling herself. MJ says that she can work, but Anna insists that school is more important and getting into college is important as well. She'll go on to ask MJ, what is she actually planning to do? Has she figured out what she's going to do yet? and MJ will reply saying that she still doesn't know. She hasn't really had time to think about it yet. However, this will put more pressure onto MJ about thinking about what she really wants to do with her life past high school. We will cut back to Spider-Man, who is swinging around the city when he bumps into none other than Jean DeWolf. Jean will shine a bright light onto Spider-Man as he tries to hide away from her, but it's revealed that she is looking for him. However, when she does see him, the shadowy outline of his six arms protrude onto the sidewalk. This catches her off guard, and she screams, takes a step back, and aims her gun at him. Spider-Man assures her that it's just him, but he has no idea how this happened. And after briefly calming her down, Spider-Man asks what Jean needs, and Jean will tell him that something weird is going down, and that she needs his help. As we cut to Jean's office, she explains that she originally planned him to take him into the station lab, but she assumes people wouldn't be too pleased to see him like this, and Spider-Man agrees. She goes on to ask him how this happened, and Spider-Man says he doesn't really know, but he's hoping to try and figure that out. In the meantime, Jean says, hopefully you can help me with this. She says that she knows they haven't always seen eye to eye, but this is something that she needs his input on. She will pull up some files on a man called Michael Morbius. Spider-Man is confused, but she explains that this man was the vampire that he fought after they did some blood tests. Spider-Man will be confused and ask why this is relevant, except the unorthodox part about this whole situation is that Michael Morbius is a married man, happy, living in the Bronx. Jean explains that she had officers check on him yesterday and he's still there. The man isn't the vampire because the vampire is locked up. Things rush through Peter's head. A clone, he'll think to himself. That would explain why he was attacking Miles Warren. Maybe he had something to do with this. Jean goes on to explain that it's not even the weirdest part. And then when Spider-Man didn't think it could get any worse, Jean tells him in the blood test that they did, they didn't just find traces of Michael Morbius' DNA, but yours too. Spider-Man's eyes widen as he's shocked by this revelation. He asks, how do they even know that? 
And Jean says that in the lab, it looked as if Morbius' DNA was spliced with parts of a superhuman type DNA structure. When broken down, the spliced DNA was found to be made of two parts, one human, one spider. Assuming that there's only one Spider-Man, Morbius' DNA had been combined with Spider-Man's to create this monster. All of a sudden, Peter puts the pieces together. The fight rages on and Peter is astoundingly outmatched. It's almost as if the vampire has Peter's skill set. During the fight, the vampire will manage to seek its teeth ever so slightly into Peter's leg. Spider-Man tells Jean that that must be how he got the six arms. During his fight with the vampire, it sliced Spider-Man, meaning that whatever mutated version of his DNA was a part of the vampire got into his bloodstream, causing all sorts of wacky side effects. Jean says that that would explain it. But more importantly, she needs answers. And she needs answers fast, because wherever this vampire came from could potentially be dangerous, and it might happen again. Spider-Man will say he has just the guy that could tell them everything about cloning. Spider-Man goes to confront Miles Warren at the ESU lab, which is still being cleared out after the vampire battle. Miles is shocked by Spider-Man's new arms, in which he confronts him about it. Miles, however, is acting coy with Spider-Man, as if he knows some deep secret that he isn't willing to reveal. Spider-Man asks him about the vampire, to which Warren becomes even more closed off. Spider-Man asks Warren if he had anything to do with it, and Warren says that he doesn't know what he's talking about. Spider-Man squints his eyes and tells him that he should come clean if he knows anything, because this could get a lot worse. Spider-Man, now confident that he knows Warren is somehow involved with this whole situation, tries to press him more, but the more he presses him, the more that Warren becomes closed off. Miles Warren will tell him that he doesn't have substantial evidence pressed against him, and after collecting some files, he decides to leave the building. We follow Warren as he leaves the lab and enters a building halfway across the city. Spider-Man will also follow him as well and tell Jean that he's on his tail. However, he will lose Warren as he enters a random building in the middle of the street. Spider-Man will crawl through one of the windows that lay open on the top floor and tries to find him. However, the building is empty. It's almost like Warren vanished into thin air. We cut back to Warren as an elevator door opens and he steps out. A brand new secret underground laboratory with Oscorp plastered all over the equipment. He will walk over to a tube-like machine which will be shrouded in smoke. Warren will remark to himself that this has to work this time. As the smoke clears, none other than Peter Parker's face emerges from the cloud. Warren's eyes widen as he steps back and trips, falling over and smashing a vat load of chemicals at the same time. They fall and sizzle over his hand, to which he reacts by flinching away. After wrapping his hand up with some bandages, he walks back over to the tube again to confirm, Spider-Man is Peter Parker. Thank you for watching this episode of Spectacular Spider-Man Season 5. If you did enjoy, make sure to hit that like button and also make sure to subscribe so you do not miss the next episode in this series. I want to thank you all for your continued support and I'll see you guys in the next one. Take care and peace.